Hello dragonflies, welcome back to Watercolor Jumpstart. In the last video, the Kayaker Project, we practiced making a simple painting by layering washes of successively darker values. Everything was one color and we only had to worry about where we were going to put the paint and what technique we were going to use to apply the paint. In this video, we're going to continue that process of learning to lay washes rather than painting individual objects and connecting our shapes into one larger shape. But this time we're going to allow some color variation. So for this activity, you're going to need um, a 16th sheet of watercolor paper. So this is the one that's about five by seven. And you'll also need this photograph, um, which if you are watching this video on my website, you should see a link either right um, before or right after the video where you can download the photograph that you'll need um, for the exercise. If you're watching on YouTube, you might want to hop over to dragonflyspiritstudio.com and uh, on the menu at the top of the page, click how to and choose how to videos from that pull down menu and that will take you to a page that has all of my how to videos and if you scroll down to um, the bowl and lemons project you'll find a link to download this photograph either directly before or directly after the video i'm going to transfer my drawing using the same technique we've used before so I've scribbled, scribbled on the back with a, a woodless graphite pencil just to get a layer of graphite there. And if you don't know how to do that, there is a video um, in the Watercolor Jumpstart series about how to transfer a drawing. And there is also a video on three different ways to transfer drawings on the how-to video page. This photo is just a little bit big for a sixteenth of a sheet of watercolor paper. So when you place it on the page, you might want to peek underneath and make sure you have all of the bowl and the lemons on your paper. Now, when I trace this, I am not going to trace the individual objects. Part of the goal of this exercise is to learn to connect individual objects into one larger shape in your initial wash and then separate them later. So when we trace this, I want you to just go around the outside perimeter, the outside of the whole silhouette of the bowl, the lemons, and the shadows underneath them. So consider that all one big shape, and we're just going to, to trace the outline of that one large shape. And then if you like, you can also trace these little divisions between the table and the background. So when I trace my shadows, I like to use a dotted line because those are a soft edge shape. And I just want an indication of where to put them. I don't want to see a big pencil line through there. So I'm going around my bowl, down the side, and then I'm only doing the outside perimeter. So I'm gonna go around this lemon, none of this. So I go around the outside of the lemon and again, I'm not going to draw this part that separates the two lemons. I'm just going to continue to trace the outside perimeter of that big connected shape made by the, the two lemons and the bowl. And then over here again for my shadow, I'm just going to give myself a dotted line. Another little section of lemon, dotted line for my shadow. Another line for that shadow. And then we'll also trace these two little wedges of light that peek in between. And that will give us just the outside perimeter of this large shape. And then we'll go ahead and put in the divisions between the wall and the table in the background. And then before I move things too far, I'll peek and make sure I have everything. Now I know on the video that doesn't look very dark, but in fact those lines are plenty dark enough for me to see what I'm doing. 
and that's all I really need. <coughs> all right, so now we have our drawing traced. And before I start, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to do, because once we get going and things are wet, we have to work at the pace of the watercolor. So we watercolorists like to think a minute about how we're going to do things before we actually get our brush moving so that once we're painting we don't feel rushed. I'm going to lay one wash that covers the two lemons, the bowl, and the shadow. Just as we did with the kayaker project where we did the trees and we went right on down into the cliff and right on down into the reflection in the water. The difference here is I am going to change color so I'll paint yellow in these spots and blue in these areas and I know some of you already are thinking well wait a minute we have to stop here or the yellow and the blue will run together there and the answer is yes they will and that's exactly what we want to have happen it turns out that although our brains are screaming those are two different objects and you need to paint them separately the light that hits this blue bowl actually bounces back into the shadow side of the lemon and into these shadows underneath. So if you look at the photo, you'll see this is actually a greenish shadow and these are quite blue. The light that bounces off of this lemon bounces down into this shadow. So even though it's darker than the yellow of the lemon, it's still got that yellowy orange glow. So if we allow the colors to mingle in that first wash, we'll get that sense of reflected light just almost magically. And then we'll come back with subsequent washes on top and divide and divide things up into separate objects. So grit your teeth on the first wash and make yourself do it. No stalling and, and trying to let things dry. Just as with any other wash, I want to start with plenty of wash mixed up so that I don't have to stop in the middle to mix more. So I'll get a nice big puddle of yellow and a nice big puddle of blue. And then I will start right over here, adding some yellow to this lemon. And you see I go right on into the next lemon. And I'm not worrying at all about this sort of orangey tone right now. We'll get that later. So continuing with the next one, keeping everything nice and wet just like you do when you're doing any other wash. Everything is nice and wet. We want this whole area to be wet at the same time. Now I'm to the point where it's time to change colors. So I'm going to switch and pick up blue on my brush, but I'm not going to wait for this stuff to dry. I'm just going to go ahead and start painting the blue. and it does move into the yellow and the yellow moves into the blue and that's exactly what we want so we're not going to panic about that and we're not going to delay hoping that maybe it won't happen there we go that's a little better if you need to turn the page to get at something from a better angle for the shape of your brush or the comfort of your wrist. It's perfectly all right to pick up the page and turn it, which I will probably do in a minute. And you see I'm working quickly. I'm trying to get this all down so that all those connections happen while everything is still wet. Now, if you have time, a couple of things you can try. These light highlights on the yellow lemons. I can try removing some of the paint with what's called a thirsty brush. So I've rinsed my brush, I've dried it off so that it's just damp. So now the brush is drier than the wash on the paper, which means that the brush will act like a mop to bring some of that color back off. Now, depending on how staining the color is and how dry it is when you go in to try this, you may or may not get a lot off. Mine has dried a little bit while I completed my wash. If you don't have time 
to do this and you see I have to do it several times because it's still wet around there so the color wants to move back into that spot. If I'm not getting enough off with my brush or if it's moving back in too much you can also try doing this with a paper towel and you'll see I get a little bit of that yellow off. It's not a lot, it's subtle, but it actually does work to create a soft highlight and it would be really hard to just paint around that and keep that soft edge. I can also try lifting this light highlight out of the blue. This might be easiest to do by taking a paper towel and kind of making a little point with it and we'll just press it down and lift. If you don't get a chance to do this, if yours is drying too fast or you've used a color such as thalo blue that doesn't lift very well, don't worry, we'll have another chance to, to try that once everything is dry. So there's this method while it's wet and there's another method when it's dry. Also while it's wet, if you want to give this a try if you have time, you can try softening the edges of these shadows. You see as you move away from the object how the shadow edge becomes soft. I rinse my brush, dry it off, so now it's just damp and I put the belly of the brush on the page and I'm dragging it sideways and letting the tip touch that edge that I want to soften. So I'm just coaxing a little bit of that paint to move into this damp area and making that edge softer. If you don't get to this in time, no problem. We will have a method for doing this when the paint is dry. This is too dry, so we'll do that by that method. And this area back here is kind of hard to get into, so we'll use the method that uh, works on dry paint to deal with softening those edges. So if you didn't have time to do any of that, that's perfectly all right. We can take care of all of that once things dry. So now it's time to let that first wash dry and then we'll come back and layer some more washes on top of that to show the difference between the various objects. So go have a little cup of tea and we'll come back in a minute and um, see if this is dry and then we can continue. All right, the first wash is dry. And before we layer anything on top, let's talk about dealing with these highlights and the um, softening of the edges if you didn't have a chance to get to them while they were wet. So for this, I'm going to use my angle shader. This is the brush that looks like a little flat brush, but the bristles are at an angle. You could use a little flat brush for this, but I like the bristles being at an angle so I can see where I'm working, whereas with a flat, I would have my hand in front of my field of view. So what I'm going to do to lift color, let's start here. Say we wanted that to be a little bit lighter. I get my angle shader wet. I blot it off just so that it's not dripping. And I use it to bring some water to the page. And I'm tapping up and down like this, not scrubbing side to side. It's kind of like when you are taking a stain out of your carpet and you just blot vertically so that you don't spread that stain any farther. And then after I've done that to loosen the paint, I can blot with my paper towel to lift the color. So you see I'm able to lift more color off. That's a little bit bigger than the actual one, um, actual reflection, but um, I needed to lift enough so that you could see it. And besides, no one, ever, no one will ever know what that looked like because I'm not going to display them side by side. I can also use my angle shader to lift a little light highlight like the one that defines the front edge of this bowl. Remember to blot off. Can you see that? I'm getting color on my angle shader. I need to blot it off or I will wind up with a little dark blob at the end where all that color is pushed to the end. I can also try lightening these two highlights on the lemons by the same method. Now each pigment has its own 
characteristics as far as how easily it lifts and I happen to know this this yellow is a fairly staining color so probably a not not a lot more is going to come off and you'll get to know your own pigments and be able to to judge how well this is going to work and plan accordingly um, if I knew that I needed those highlights to be a lot lighter than that then I might have to consider another technique but that's the top that's a topic for another video so we're going to say that's good enough for us that that actually looks pretty good to me you can see enough of the highlight to tell the a bit of the shape of the lemon and that's all I really want now let's move on to showing the difference between these two lemons showing that they're two separate objects what tells us that these are separate objects what our brain looks for to decide where one object ends and another begins is any kind of abrupt change and especially several abrupt changes several different types that happen in the same place so across this little edge here there's a a jump in value this side is darker and there's a abrupt change in color so this is a pale yellow and this is sort of a golden orangey brown the same thing happens down here so if I layer over just this portion with this shadow shape on the back side of the lemon and this shadow color underneath that will give the viewer the clue that these are two separate objects so I don't have to paint them individually I can just paint this second layer on top so to do that we'll need sort of an orangey browny color for the shadow so let's mix up some orangey tones for the shadow this part of the shadow has actually got a little bit of a blue green quality to it so I'll mix a little bit of that too in case I want to add that part and same thing happens down here it becomes more brown down below now if you don't get all those variations in the first time you try this that's fine remember our primary goal here is to get the idea of having one connected wash that we separate later with partial washes on top so I'm going to go in and try to create this shadow shape but I'm not going to be too concerned about getting it perfect one difficulty at a time so while I'm learning this skill if I don't manage to get the shadow shape exactly as it is on the photograph I'm not going to worry about it there's a little bit of a sort of a blue green area up here and then I'm going to go in while it's wet and soften all those edges again if you don't get this part perfectly that's okay the main goal is to learn the idea of layering these washes to create the effect of different objects without painting each object individually now I think I'd like to soften that shadow shape a little bit too it's hard to do in here so maybe we'll deal with that when we deal with softening this edge now you can see that these are two separate objects because there's an abrupt change in value and abrupt change in color right there and right here so let's move over now and look at this lemon against the bowl if you squint so that some of the details are taken away you'll see that in the photograph this side of the lemon is actually lighter than the bowl and what tells you that the bowl and the lemon are separate is this darker patch of blue on the back on the uh, side of the bowl so we'll have to paint our shadow shape on the lemon and then let that dry and then come back and paint this darker blue shape so let's go ahead and create the shadow on the second lemon and then I don't have to paint the whole lemon I only have to paint that shadow shape this one is a little bluer and there's some blue already there so that helps us out and then as this shadow turns to the light it becomes a little more of an orangey tone so if you have time and you want to try for that you can 
If you don't have time, just make it all one color. That's just fine. And that color actually continues down into the shadow underneath. So let me just pull a little bit of that down there. And now I rinse my, rinse my brush and soften this edge. If you are left-handed, that's an awkward angle. Turn it upside down. All right, I'm not going to worry about trying to make that exactly like that lemon. Now, before I come in here and paint that darker swath, I do want to let this dry because now I'm at the point where I'm showing the difference between these two objects. So while we're waiting for that to dry, let's talk about, we talked about lifting with the angle shader. Let's talk about softening an edge. This edge right back here on the back of the shadow and this edge on the back of that shadow we didn't get a chance to go in and soften those while they were wet. So I'll take my angle shader and again I get it wet, blot it off so it's not drippy and I'm tapping vertically just as I did before but this time I am not blotting. All I want to do is move some of that color. I don't want to take it off the page. How much this will work, how soft you can get it how much the pigment moves is again a matter of which pigments you're using. So I'm going to pick those up and see if I can get the camera to focus on that closer. So compare those shadow edges with the edges of the bowl. Let's see if I can hold it still enough so you can see. So here you can see the difference between the edge of the bowl, that's a nice hard edge that I haven't softened, and the edge of the shadow that we just softened. So now these washes, these smaller washes, have dried and I can come in and show the, the separation between the bowl and this lemon with this little bit of a darker blue. And I think that will be easier for me if I flip this over so that I can use the tip of my brush to go along that edge more easily. And my bowl is darker than the bowl in the um, photograph, but I kind of like that, so I'm going to leave that that way. And I'll add just a little bit more right here, and this kind of just sweeps around the side of the bowl, and then I think I will soften that edge because this bowl has sort of a soft texture to it. And then there is also a darker blue underneath that helps to show the distinction between the bowl and its shadow. So I will also add that right now. Again, I'm not trying to be too terribly concerned with making my shapes exactly the same. Right now we're trying to learn the technique and I'll be happy enough if it just looks like a bowl, which it does. Next, let's look at this shadow here. In, um, in the photograph, this shadow is quite a bit darker, and there's sort of a dark shadow right underneath the edge, and that's part of what helps us see the distinction between the lemon and its shadow. So let's add that. This one actually almost looks good enough the way it is, but... This one needs a little bit more dark. So this shadow, I'm going to paint a little bit of a graded wash right here where the shadow, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, how hopefully you'll be able to see this, where the shadow curls underneath the lemon, it's quite dark. And then it gets paler and more orangey as I move away. So I can paint that as a little bitty graded wash. A little bit of extra water there that I'm drinking up with my brush so that I don't have a little puddle. And now you can see this shadow separated, or this lemon separated from its shadow. For this one, I think all I need is that little bit of the dark shadow that curls underneath the lemon. So just a little brush stroke there. And maybe the same here with my bowl, just a little brush stroke. 
And let's let that dry. And while that's drying, we'll come back and do something with the background. Now in the photograph, I have made the background solid black just because there was a lot of clutter in the actual photograph and the easiest thing for me to do was just to Photoshop it all down to black. But typically if you try to paint an area solid black in a watercolor, it looks sort of dead and lifeless. And I have a lovely sense of light bouncing around in this painting and I don't want to lose that. Now I could just leave the background white. This is a perfectly nice little painting with a white background. But um, if we want to give some color back here, it would be a good idea to use at least some of the pigments that we've used elsewhere so that it will feel like it belongs to the same world. And I've used ultramarine blue in my bowl, so since we know that ultramarine blue and either burnt sienna or burnt umber make a nice gray or range of grays, let's mix a nice dark blue-gray back there from ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, or you can use burnt umber if that's what you have. You know those two pigments will make a range of grays that go all the way from a blue-gray to a more of a brown. And just as with anything else, I want plenty of wash so that I'll not run out in the middle. If I'm not sure, you know, when you mix this stuff on the palette, it it looks darker than it might on paper. So let's check it and see on our little test sheet. Do we like that color? That looks pretty good. I think this wash will be easier for me being right-handed to lay this way so that I can use the tip of my brush to work around the shapes. If you're left-handed, you might want to turn your page this way so that again you can use the tip of your brush to go around the shapes and just like every other wash I want to get plenty of paint on the uh, plenty of liquid on the page plenty of my paint mixture so that water will help even things out so I'm going to try to carry that same bead that I would always carry So let me pause just a moment. So, so dark. I don't know if you can see that there's a bead collecting there. Yeah, there you go. So just like any other wash, I keep that bead flowing. And that way I can take my time. These aren't terribly complicated shapes to paint around. But when they become more complicated, when I tackle a more complex painting, if I'm keeping a bead flowing, I can take my time because I don't have to worry about this drying out and getting streaky while I'm being careful about where I put my paint around the objects that I'm painting around. So keeping that bead, bead flowing down the page. You don't have to feel rushed. You can take your time. When you try to get into a little area like this, having your brush not quite so wet makes things a little easier. So in that small area, you might carry just a little less water. And the brush will release the wash a little more evenly when, the, when there's a little less water on the brush. So again, right here, maybe a little less water as I find my way around that little point and then back to nice speed. Yeah, it looked like plenty of wash, but I probably should have mixed more. It'll be just enough, but you can learn from my mistake and mix more for yourself so that you don't feel rushed. And so that you aren't worried about, what if I run out? How will I get that exact same shade of gray when I have to do it so fast? But luckily, we have just enough. 
All right, let's get this dry so that we can evaluate it without the shine on the paper. And just like any other wash, before I walk away, I want to blot up any excess so that I don't get a little bloom here from moisture collecting under the tape on this side. All right, so let's again go have another cup of tea and we'll come back and see if we want to make any final adjustments. All right, so we're back and our background is dry and it's time to see if we have any final adjustments that we want to make. Now, if I go to my photograph and start saying, well, let's see, what down here doesn't look exactly like the photo, I'll run the risk of fiddling with this more than I should. Let's first look at the watercolor itself, kind of ignore this photo for a moment. We don't need that unless we need information. Let's look at the watercolor itself and ask ourselves what's working really well and what's not working so well. So I think that um, one thing that's working really well is the sense of light. And I, I will turn the photo over just for a moment so that you can see what I mean. The sense of strong light is is actually stronger in my um, painting than it is in the photograph. And the colors are more vibrant. So I don't really want to wreck that in uh, chasing around things like this little shadow shape on the end of the lemon. Okay, that's nice, but I would rather keep the this, this sense of light and the luminous clear washes than to copy every little shape. One thing that maybe isn't working as well is it's a little bit hard to see the whole shape of the bowl. Um, it's not bad. I, I might just live with it. But as long as we know how to do a little bit of lifting with the angle shader, let's see if we can give the viewer just a little bit more of a clue to the shape of this bowl by looking at some of these reflections on this side. So I'll get my angle shader wet, dry it off, and let's just sweep a little bit of color off of that side of the bowl. And that helps to give the sense of the roundness of the bowl. And I think if we did a little bit of the rim over here, well, that's too dry to do anything. And perhaps a little of the highlight on this side. Less is more with stuff like this. I think that's enough. Uh, if I keep fiddling, I'll run the risk of losing some of the beautiful things that um, I really like about this painting. And so I don't want to chase the photograph. If the photograph was all that fabulous to begin with, then a photo enlargement would be a lot easier way to get something to put on my wall or just a nice print of the photo than to, to bother with doing a painting. So let's um, actually keep the things that are much better in the painting um, and not worry too much about copying everything just because it's in the photo. Another thing to do at this stage is to take the tape off because these little streaky marks on the side, you don't really realize it, but they influence your evaluation of the painting quite a bit. So let's get the tape off. Now, if you ever have a problem with the paper tearing as you're taking off your masking tape, warm up the masking tape with a hairdryer and that will soften the adhesive so that it doesn't tear the paper. So let's move that off that shiny surface. And that's actually quite a nice painting, just as it is. There's no need for me to go in and fiddle and chase the photograph. And in fact, I like the painting a whole lot better than I like the photograph. It has much more vibrant color, much more of a sense of light, 
and I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of, oh, I don't see that end of the lemon, because who knows how I had my lemon oriented or what the shape of that particular lemon was. Why chase that and, re and risk wrecking the beauty that we have? So let's be restrained and put our brushes down and say that that one looks good. Let's let's pause there. Now you can go and do this exercise again. Um, try it again with the same colors. The first time you try anything, you're you're learning as you go, and a lot of things are happening fast, and you don't have a chance to anticipate. And the second time, you learn a bit more, and the third time, you learn a bit more, and then you can try things like play up, play around with the colors. Those could be limes instead of lemons. They could be purple lemons. It's our world. We get to do whatever we want in, in our little paintings. And set up some still lifes of your own. Just one caveat there. Make sure that you choose objects that have a fairly simple shape. Because remember, our goal here was to practice this process of one big wash with smaller washes on top to divide things up. And if you start having to worry about painting a really complicated shape, you'll lose track of the learning goal that you're trying to achieve. When this becomes really boring and you feel like you can do it in your sleep, then choose slightly more complicated objects or a few more objects. Maybe work a little larger um, when you add more objects because if I add a whole lot more objects here and each object is tiny, then it gets really hard to find those shapes with my brush. So keep it at a comfortable size to work with your brush um, as you add more complicated colors, shapes, and objects, and use the same planning method here. And you can get quite, you can go, go quite, a, quite a distance with this technique of layering washes to plan your watercolor and you'll have ob you'll have paintings where the objects look like they belong to the same world and relate to one another instead of looking like little paper cutouts glued down to the page. So until the next time, happy painting!